well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad that you are with us today. Uh, the us, in this case, John Rochford, who is a grad student at Iowa State University, former columnist for uh, Iowa State Daily, the uh, campus newspaper, and a guy who has a fantastic column uh, about, uh, generally speaking, about the the uh, fight against individuality right now. I mean, we talk a lot about cancel culture. We talk a lot about uh, you know the, uh, uh, the 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 cultural fights that are going on right now. But I think a huge part of the idea of cancel culture it's actually conformist culture, right? And it's if you if you step outside of the narrow path, if you draw outside of the lines. Uh, that you will be smacked down. Now, this is nothing new in American history. We've had our moments of cultural conformity coming from both the left and the right. But, uh, you know, honestly, I mean, I think we really have been blessed to to live in a time period uh, for mm, at least the last 50 years or so uh, where individual freedom and individual liberty has been celebrated. That includes the freedom to think and to say, as well as things like the right to keep and bear arms. So we're going to get into a fascinating conversation. And this is, sometimes I do interviews. This is a conversation with John Rochford. And I had a great time talking with him. I, I want to do it again, but we'll get to that momentarily. Before we do, President Trump has a big announcement for his top supporters. We celebrating the 2020 Republican National Convention this summer, and he wants you to enter for your chance to join him at the convention. If you win... His team will cover the flight, hotel, and give you VIP passes for yourself and a guest. All you have to do is text ARMS to 88022 today for your chance to meet President Trump at the convention. Again, that is A-R-M-S, ARMS, as in bearing arms. A-R-M-S, did I get that right? Yeah, A-R-M-S. I want to make sure I spelled it correctly. Uh, to 88022 to enter to win this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be President Trump's special guest, paid for by Donald J. Trump for President Incorporated. So without any further ado, uh, let's get to that conversation with John Rochford about the threat to individuality, uh, including, uh, for for John, uh, this idea that uh, minorities like himself are unable to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Take a look and a listen. John, thank you so much, sir, for coming to the program. It's great talking with you today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Cam. Uh, absolutely. I, I ran across your column at uh, Iowa State Daily. You're a former columnist there and a, uh, a grad student in history at Iowa State. Is that right? In the history, yes, in the history department. Yeah. Yep. What's yep. your? We just out of curiosity. What's your focus? Uh, it's American history broadly. Uh, my my main field is going to be American military history. Oh, fantastic! I, I'm a amateur history nerd so uh i always i always like to hey. to, to inquire uh, oh no i i love it uh, so you know you've got a great piece um i am a minority i am an individual and i am free uh and this was actually written in response to a column that had appeared at uh at the iowa state daily what was this column all about john oh boy um <laughs> that <laughs> yeah that column yeah. essentially Man, it's hard, honestly. You know, that, that column was essentially trying to say that the entire non-white population of the United States, uh, was not free. Uh, I mean, that's really, that's really what it was. And, and in a really grandiose attempt, uh, to use, to use words, the, that particular author of that article tried to Say that basically the the U.S. national anthem and our kind of our culture here essentially is is very very anti-black anti-minority to the point where we aren't free or autonomous as minority. And and the Second Amendment was a big part of that argument. It sounds like right uh, there was a uh, a line: "Black people can't bear an arm without getting shot." Right, and you know the what's interesting about the the article I responded to is that uh, the author opened up talking about the increased shootings over the Fourth of July kind of time period in Chicago, uh, without going into the, into really much depth of what you know what were, was the causation of those shootings, who was doing the shooting, and I and I imagine that's where she was coming from in that sense. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, I, so it's really it's really hard because it it, it wasn't a Dell dot argument, but yeah, that essentially we can't bear arms because we'll be shot if we do so, or we can't. Uh, and it really kind of intimates, in my view of, of her article, it intimates that it's basically the state or or white people who are suppressing that right, which is clearly ludicrous. I was going to say, so you obviously uh, disagree with that assertion. Um, and, and, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, I'm a white guy in my mid-40s, live in rural Virginia. Um, but I know that I'm not the stereotypical American gun owner because I don't think there is a stereotypical American gun owner at, at this point. Uh, back in, I guess it was back in uh, May, maybe late April, uh, there were the reopen protests that were taking place in Lansing, Michigan. And there were a number of uh, gun owners who were there there were some lawmakers who claimed that uh, that they felt intimidated. And so I think it was maybe two or three days after that, a uh, black Democrat lawmaker got an armed escort from black and brown gun owners to her office there at the state capitol. Uh, and I talked with Mike Lynn Jr., who was part of that group that was, you know, walking with the uh, the representative. And I asked, why did you do this? And he said, well, we wanted to, you know, there, there's that that theory out there that black men can't walk around openly carrying rifles and something bad will happen and white people can get away with it. He said, we wanted to prove that wrong. Uh, and, and they did. You write about the um, uh, armed group of uh, black gun owners down in uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia. I, I can't say the name of the organization on the, uh, on this family friendly program, but the not mm -hmm, around coalition, I believe is uh, what they're called. Uh, you say they were heavily armed. Uh, you say the same organization appeared in Texas uh, and though you may not fully agree with the entire ideological agenda of these groups, you do agree with the right to bear arms, and they've been able to do so without right. consequence. Right, exactly. Without and without a shooting, you know, and, and that's and that's an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of juxtaposition to the the lawlessness. You know, I, I'm glad you did bring up you did bring up the the Michigan protest. Because it's, a, you know, and I think I'm trying to make a point in my article again in, in, in that, you know, there's, when it comes to, it's, I think that the media in general and, and people who are, uh, very left centric politically are having a hard time trying to kind of fit where black gun owners are at this point in their kind of ideological positioning because you, you, you don't see the, the same criticism from the people who are criticizing the Lansing protest for people being armed. And, you know, so it's, it's just, it's a really, it's ideology. And I talk about ideology quite a bit and it's really difficult, I think, right now for a lot of people who are certainly staunch anti gun or anti carry whatever. Uh, it, it's really hard for them to kind of Fit that in right now. I, I think you're right, and again, I think I, I think part of it is because uh, you know I won't I won't lay this all on the media, and I won't lay this all on the left. I think we as human beings we look for those simple solutions, and we look for those simple narratives right. as opposed to uh, you know understanding the complexity of, of of human nature. And we are all I mean, as your piece says, you are an individual. So when we talk about right. black gun owners or white gun owners or even gun owners as some monolithic group. Well, that's absurd because as individuals, we all have our own reasons as to why we're exercising Absolutely. our Second Amendment rights. And we all have our own background and our own experiences that we bring to the table. Absolutely. And I think, and, and you know, even my article, honestly, was, you know, I mean, it ended up being kind of gun, gun focused just kind of because of it was brought up in that original article. Uh, but it really, you know, the intent of it wasn't supposed to be kind of focused on that. Mm -hmm. what, what I think and what you just mentioned is correct is that uh, with this author, but not just her, but others, you you see this kind of anti-individualism. And with that, it, and, and like you just mentioned, it's really hard, I think, for, for people who are very anti-individual or who do want simple solutions and who do want to put people in boxes so they can explain things easier, it's really hard for them to to uh, come to different conclusions that hey we're all different. I mean I'm I'm going to be completely different than you know I'm I'm a, I'm a mixed race guy. I'm going to be completely different than the other mixed race guy. I might be similar to the white person. I might be similar to another black person. You know it's very it's just it's very hard to to put people in boxes like that. 
It, you know, it, it absolutely is. My my two oldest kids, John, are biracial. Um, and I was talking to my oldest son a couple of weeks ago. He lives in Oklahoma. And we were talking about the protests that had taken place in Tulsa and, you know, some of the things going on. And he said, he said, it's so weird, Dad. He said, you know, I guess there was something posted on Facebook maybe like two or three weeks ago about, uh, you know, tell a black person how much you love them or something like that. I mean, it was, it was, it was like something that ridiculous. He said, all of a sudden my white friends one day just start texting me. Hey, I want you to know I love you. Uh, and he said, okay, but why, why didn't you tell me this last week? You know? And then he said, I've got my black friends who are telling me you need to raise a fist. You need to be out here marching. And he, he said, I was literally born on the fence. He said, I see, yeah. you know, where the perspective of black lives matter is coming from. I see the perspective of white people. He said, but, all of the people that I talked to, he said, none of them really seem that interested in hearing what I have to say and what I believe, because again, everybody's trying to put him in that box. Uh, and right. you know, and, and I, it was so frustrating for him. Uh, and I, 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 I you know, I, it, it just, it bothers me that I, and I think that you really hit on the key there that part of this ideology really is about suppressing your individuality. And it is about, you can call it consensus. You can call it, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to, uh, to to find a majority opinion and just go with the majority. But ultimately, what that means is um, you will conform, you will comply, or you will be depersoned. You will be otherized. Your individual experiences simply don't matter. Absolutely. And two, I want a couple things. I want to emphasize that you you brought up there at the beginning when you started talking about your son. Uh, that's another exception I took uh, with the the author's original article as well. Would you do, it seems, and I do, I mean, I think down farther, there's a line that I put in about, you know, who better to tell me I'm not free, you know, than a white sophomore female at Iowa State. <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was, that was intended to be, you know, a little bit, you know, kind of snappy or whatever. Hey, you're you're allowed to be a little a snarky. Lar a larger, <laughs> yeah, it does bring up a larger point, though, I think right now, when you do see, uh, with certain, and, and I don't like to really even say it necessarily, certain white people, especially kind of the progressive minded, those people who are, you know, asking, you know, the same people that are asking your son how you're doing or, you know, reaching out and doing that type of stuff. And something the, the author makes a point in saying is that it's basically, and not just in that article and, and several, it's basically up to white people to help free minorities. And I take extreme exception to that because I don't need her to, to say, to say that I need her to free me. That would be me surrendering my autonomy. That would be me, me surrendering basically my freedom and also me surrendering the, the point that she has power over me by virtue of her race. I, I that's actually, you know, that, that's, I'm not saying that she is a racist. I know her. Okay. I know who she is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, but at the same time, it's really interesting. If you went back to 1860 and you talked to a, you talked to a slaveholder in 1860, they would tell you that slavery is a good thing because we are Christianizing the barbarous black massacre. We are providing for them. We are we're feeding them, we're clothing them, we're not putting them in the same condition as northern uh, wage slavery. You know, so we're actually helping. And so it's really kind of similar types of paternalistic racism that you do see from those progressive types saying that we it's up to us to free or up to us to provide and amplify the voices of minorities. No, it's not. I have my own voice. I'm not I, I'm glad I don't live in the world. That you that you perceive black or any other minority to come from, I don't need that. That's that's wrong. A absolutely. I don't know if you saw the story. I think it was uh, making the rounds yesterday. Um, police officer in Portland, Oregon, uh, went public and was talking about how you know he's getting a little tired of mostly white Antifa types trying to tell him what a racist he is uh, and, and, and trying to, you know, tell him about the black experience because um, 
he's black and and they're white and and yet they're lecturing him on 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 you know uh you know the 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 problems that uh that that are inherent in him being a police officer rather than actually listening to him uh you know and right. to, and to listen to his yeah. experience and and i think you're right paternalistic uh, paternalistic is is a very good word to use so is condescending uh, and, and I think it, it, it is very, it's a very demeaning attitude. As you say, I don't necessarily think it's always intentional. Um, but even if it's well meaning, you know, there's this shocking lack of self awareness about, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I want to be a good ally, but instead you're, you're really just being patronizing. Right. And that, and that, you know, what I would call true racism as well. I don't, I, I just, I, that I take, such extreme exception that I did hear about that story, uh, and there's been a couple. There's been a couple others, kind of more other uh, other high profile stories that are similar to that. But it also brings up another point I talk about quite often that there is a difference between being uh, capital in in the kind of the ideological sense. There's a difference in capital B blackness, and there's a and there's a difference in just you know undercase blackness, right? So like for me. You know, I was adopted when I was a, when I was a baby, you know, and I've always known that. And I grew up in a white family that I, you know, I met my biological family. I know who they are. I hang out with them quite often. But because of my political opinion or because of even how I speak or how I think or what I do, let me tell you, since, and this is, it's not just since May, but it kind of picked up since then. I've been called, and I'm sure this is something others can relate to, uh, Uncle Tom, Cornball Brother, uh, a zebra, stupid zebra at that, uh, and some other pejorative. And it's because, and, and then, or, oh, you don't get your black car anymore. You know, that, that proverbial black car, we're taking that away from you. Well, you know, so when I look at what does it mean to even be, to be black, to them, it's, it's very ideological. There's a certain way in which you might have to think. And it's actually very similar to what Joe Biden said, right? If you're not going to vote for him or you're thinking about where you have to think about it, you're not black. It's very ideological. For me, you know, I guess blackness then is kind of a paradox because blackness can mean anything because we're all individuals. So there is, there is that kind of uh, interesting dichotomy, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, again, it gets back to that idea of, do you have the freedom uh, to be an individual and, and, and not just under the law, but in terms of the culture? And I, I you know, I, I think that we are, um, I, I think we've been blessed since really, the, you know, the end of World War II to live in a society that valued individual freedom. Uh, I think that I, I worry that those days are coming to a close. Uh, and that, uh, you know, this idea of cultural conformity is, is becoming the norm. Um, and it's not just about uh, erasing toxic ideas. It's not just about eradicating racism. It's not just about making it unacceptable to say the N word in public. It 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 really goes, you know. I mean, again, I think ninety percent of Americans would uh, would would agree. Okay, yeah, that's 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 a good thing. We're now getting into some fifty fifty propositions. We may even be getting into John some forty sixty propositions, right? Where if you say, uh, yeah, go ahead. It's less than that. Yeah, I mean, it's less than that. I mean, the people that are screaming the loudest are the minority. I mean, the minority ideologically, the, the extreme minority ideologically. I mean, that's, it, it, it's incredible to me that we have such an extreme minority of people that have such a high level of social and, dare I say, institutional power when you talk about the media or you talk about uh, other types of social media, other types of institutions like that. Their voices are amplified quite heavily, mm -hmm. and they are they are overrepresented in what, how they think and how they feel. I mean, from when I did write for the Daily, uh, I, I had the opportunity to talk to other minorities. I mean, I had a, I I had a five hour discussion at Parks Library on campus with one of the very very few transgender students, and you know, she looks at, we you know five hours of talking. And how the similar experiences that we perceive, and one of the m most lasting things that I took from that conversation that she said was, I don't want people to feel like they have to walk around an eggshells around me. I'm not, 
I, you know, I and most of us are not these activist types that are seeking to kind of delve into power politics, which is what it is. It's power politics. You know, mm-hmm. it's like when you mentioned, when you mentioned, you know, not being able to say the N word, there's been some controversy here at, at, at like the University of Iowa and, and other places, uh, with kind of different accusations. But at the same time, it's like, well, you know, yeah, we shouldn't, you, you know, a white person shouldn't say that word. Certainly, but neither should you know, neither should a black person. We can't we can't begin to put limits on language and say, well, this is okay for A, but not for B, and vice versa. I mean, that is that's power politics, and it's not healthy for this country, and that's being exacerbated by social media and the media. Absolutely. Um, all right, listen. Let's. We, I, I've I've really enjoyed our conversation. I want to have you back, but uh, I also want to let, let let's turn back to the second member for a second. Since this is Barry and Arms, Cam and Company, John. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah nope. <laughs> yep. But again, I, I, I really have enjoyed this conversation. And I, I frankly, I mean, honestly, this is the type of conversation I'd like to turn on my TV set and see more of. Rather than uh, talking heads, right. just yelling at each other. Um, so I do appreciate you coming on. But 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 as a yeah. Uh, a minority gun owner, um, uh, you know, what, what has been your experience have uh, it, both from, you know, the, the, the second amendment community and then from the non gun owning community, what, what has been your experience as a gun owner? Well, as a gun owner, I, I mean, I, I guess I don't really have too much of an, an experience per se. I mean, I, you know, I applied for my carry permit, had no problem. You know, I mean, there, it was very fast. It was very efficient. Uh, when I go to my local gun store in Story City, the Jacobson Gun Center, they are extraordinarily knowledgeable. They, they help. They, we, we talk. It's, I mean, it's just like any other transaction. I mean, it's really not bad at all for the anti-gun community. I guess I don't know because they really don't know either, you know? So, right. I mean, I, I don't, I don't uh, carry it around, but I know that it's, uh, uh, Guns are quite taboo and aims, I suppose, when you're talking about at least if you're getting around my peers or or uh, kind of into the, the university setting. But I mean, it's not something I guess I talk about too much. But it's been fine. I mean, there's been nothing. That's part of that article. I mean, I've never to say that I don't have that right. And that's not something I'm able to do. That's just not true. That's I mean, not been your not. experience. In fact, it's actually no, not even. It's not even. It's not even in the ballpark of my experience, and that and that it, that transcends just me. You know, I can speak for myself, but I'm also pretty confident in speaking uh, speaking for others on that too. So, so what has the reaction been to your column, John? It's been actually pretty positive. You know, I, the thing the thing that I worry about most is the reaction, not necessarily from the public, but mm-hmm. the reactions from from the university at times, you know, I, I do, one of the biggest fears I always have is that the cancel culture type of, of stuff. But luckily though, I mean, I usually get, I mean, I get emails from, from everybody from, from different places in the country on camp, from people on campus, from professors to students to everybody else. And they, you know, the, the over, the overwhelming kind of thematic message from those, from the, uh, the, the emails that come in is, Thank you for saying this because we are too scared to say it. These types of things, whether it's talking about, I've, I've written, you know, I don't know if you've seen, uh, but I've written several times on um, the Second Amendment specifically and and guns specifically. Uh, but I, I get the feedback that people are you know, people are a little afraid to kind of say these things on campus for themselves. So they're just very happy that someone is. That's wow. usually what it comes down to. Well, I, I am glad that uh, you're using your First Amendment right uh, in defense of the Second. And uh, again, this is a fantastic column. I would encourage everybody to read the entire thing. Uh, we'll put a link up uh, at barryandarms.com to the Iowa State Daily column. But, uh, John, you, you've got to come back uh, at some point. I, I really did enjoy our conversation. would love to talk again. Uh, maybe we can get into American military history. Oh, hey, I'd love that. By the way, you talk about cancel culture. I, I mean... American history is kind of on the chopping block. You know, the military, I don't know about that. So, uh, you're a little worried that, uh, that, right. you're, <laughs> that your chosen field might be canceled at some point in the future? You know, military history has already been fairly stigmatized back in the 80s and 90s. 
And I can tell you in the department I'm in right now, I love everybody in my history department, everybody from the chair of the history department to through all of my cohorts, love them. But I know that there's this really kind of aversion to military history within my cohort. And, and that comes from the fact that a lot of that there's, you know, there's a few past this and there's others that don't know how much it, it matters or whatnot. And I know that sometimes even kind of patriotism and that type of stuff, you know, the, the, the traditional stuff can be is kind of to some degree kind of looked down on at this point. But no, I'm not worried about that necessarily because I'm not afraid to write about that stuff. So I have, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I get down to work and that's, that's fine. I don't, yeah, it's all good. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Well, listen, John, thanks for spending some time with us today. It was fantastic talking with you, and I really do look forward to doing this again soon. Oh, please, let me know. I'll come on anytime. Excellent. John Rochford uh, joining us there uh, from Iowa State, grad student in the history department uh, here on Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Really do appreciate uh, John spending some time with us today. Looking forward to having him back. We might just digress one day and have John on and talk military history for like 20 minutes, maybe more. That'd be all right. Let me know in the comments below. All right, let's get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, our recidivist report. Before we do that, however, just a, another quick reminder that President Trump has a huge announcement for his top supporters. He will be celebrating the 2020 Republican National Convention this summer, and he wants you to enter for your chance to join him at the convention. If you win, the team will cover the flight, hotel, and give you VIP passes for yourself and a guest. All you have to do is text ARMS to 88022 today for your chance to meet President Trump at the convention. Again, that is A-R-M-S to 88022 to enter to win this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be his special guest. Paid for by Donald J. Trump for President Incorporated. All right, let's get to, uh, we'll start with our uh, recidivist report today. Story out of Illinois. And, you know, there are all kinds of headlines right now about well, violent crimes up. Why is this going on here? And, of course, the Washington Post and other anti-gun outlets say, well, it's because of all the gun sales. That's what's happening here. No, it's really not. Because we're seeing violent crime increase in places where there have not really been an increase in gun sales. New York City, for example, shootings up nearly 300% compared to the same time last year. There aren't a lot of gun stores in New York City. Governor Cuomo had ordered gun shops across the state of New York closed. Uh, and even if you wanted to be a legal gun owner in New York City and you had applied for your pistol premises license back in March, you haven't been approved yet. So, no, it's not the increase in gun sales that has been leading to the increase in violent crime. I think it's much more the increase in uh, unrest on the streets, the attacks on law enforcement generally, uh, the uh, and then the specific attacks on uh, individual law enforcement officers sometimes in the uh, line of duty. Uh, and the coronavirus closures that have led to, I think what I saw a story USA Today, about 8% of the prison population has been let loose uh, due to uh, coronavirus concerns. Court systems are operating on skeleton crews, uh, and so the legal system uh, is sort of hobbling along at the moment. And then in cities like New York City, Portland, Oregon, you've had the disbanding of units that are specialized units that target the most violent offenders. Uh, and they've been taken off of the streets. Actually, they haven't been taken off the streets, but they're they're no longer focusing on those most violent offenders. I think those are some of the reasons uh, why we are seeing an increase in crime. But check out this story, uh, again, from uh, the Champaign, Illinois area, where a prosecutor in Urbana, Illinois, says a woman who was shot earlier this week, um, apparently this was the, the possible motive, prosecutor says, uh, was an earlier shooting. And this story is played out in, 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 in various forms in cities across the country on a daily basis. Uh, state's attorney, this is from, by the way, the News Gazette in uh, Champaign-Urbana. State's attorney Julia Reed said Damian Carter made reference to the April 11th fatal shooting of Tyrius Pettis, who was 15 years of age, before, Reed's alleged, excuse me, before Carter allegedly shot this 19-year-old woman. Uh, there in Champaign, who is related to Pettis. She was shot in the leg. Police think that Tyrius Pettis was shot as revenge for his involvement in the 2018 shooting of another teen who was left paralyzed from the waist down. That teen was hit while riding on the handlebars of a bicycle. Tyrius was also riding a bicycle when he was killed. So it's this cycle of violence, right? Somebody gets shot, 
take revenge. They don't go to the police. They don't, they don't look for justice within the criminal justice system. Uh, they take revenge or they seek street justice. And it's this vicious cycle that goes back and forth. According to the uh, News Gazette, a uh, 16-year-old Troy Carter has been charged with Tyrius Pettis' murder back in April. He's now awaiting trial. Damian Carter, who's accused of shooting Pettis' relative, that 19-year-old woman, he's been charged with aggravated battery with a firearm, which carries a mandatory prison term of between 6 and 30 years upon conviction. He has been charged as an adult, by the way. Uh, the judge in this case set his bond at $250,000, gave him until July 23rd to hire his own attorney. This is buried at the bottom of this story. The prosecutor said that just hours before the shooting, hours before this 19-year-old woman was shot, Damian Carter had appeared before Judge Tom DeFanis in juvenile court and was resentenced to probation for unlawful use of a weapon for carrying a loaded gun in a backpack last August in Urbana. The prosecutor took steps to revoke Carter's probation because he wasn't following the probation rules. But she and Carter's attorney agreed to a probationary sentence because he was, quote, doing well on probation in the last few months. And then a few hours after agreeing to that extension of probation, Damian Carter allegedly shot a 19-year-old woman. So, prosecutor, again, originally said she wanted to revoke this young man's probation. If that had happened, this 19-year-old would not have been shot. Carter would not be now looking at a felony charge. But instead, the uh, said, well, he's doing well. You know, he's, he's, I mean, yeah, he's had some slip-ups, but he's doing well. Well, how well was he really doing? How well was the system really keeping track of this young man and helping to turn his life around? Because, again, keep in mind, in the juvenile justice system, it's not about punishment. It's supposed to be about rehabilitation. Well, it sounds like Damian Carter wasn't rehabilitated as a part of his uh, probation. Sounds like he didn't learn the right lessons, learn the wrong lessons, learn that when he breaks the law, nothing happens. And the consequences not only aren't severe, they don't exist. Now a 19-year-old woman recovering from her injuries. Damian Carter looking at a potential 30-year sentence if he is uh, ultimately found guilty. Probably going to get a plea deal. I mean, you know, 97% chance that's what happens in felony cases in the uh, criminal justice system in this country. So Damian Carter probably going to get a plea deal, probably going to learn another wrong lesson. Or maybe at this point he is learning the right lesson. That there really aren't severe consequences for engaging in severely violent crimes. All right. On to our uh, armed citizen story of the day from uh, Pennsylvania, where a, a district attorney says there will be no charges in the shooting of a suspect after a double murder, uh, this is another case kind of similar to what we had talked about uh, on yesterday's armed citizen story, where somebody who was not involved in this initial altercation, but who was an armed citizen in the right place at the right time to at least partially uh, stop this attack. So this actually took place in Sellins Grove, Pennsylvania. This was last week. There was a guy who had an order of protection out against him, was not supposed to be near his ex-wife, violated that order of protection, had a gun. As his ex and a, another man were standing in the parking lot of a Buffalo Wild Wings, um, he uh, got out of his pickup truck and opened fire, killing 52-year-old Matthew Bowersox and 46-year-old Heather Campbell. There's a gentleman who's inside the restaurant. He's waiting to be seated, and he sees this happen. Now, he's a concealed carry holder. So this gentleman then leaves the restaurant, goes outside in the parking lot, shot and wounded uh, 55-year-old Christopher Fernandez, uh, who, uh, again, pulled the trigger, killing Matthew Bowersox and uh, Heather Campbell uh, as he walked back to his pickup truck. DA said, uh, quote, thankfully, he helped prevent further bloodshed. That armed citizen did. Uh, again, authorities say that uh, Campbell had obtained a protection from abuse order against Fernandez, but officials say he, they believe that he was stalking her. May have put a GPS tracking device uh, to her car. Fernandez has now been charged with first-degree murder, remains under guard uh, in the hospital. Preliminary hearing scheduled for uh, July 27th. We'll keep an eye on that case, but again, the armed citizen who shot that uh, double murder suspect 
uh, will not be facing any charges, acting in uh, defense of others, uh, if not defense of himself. And finally today, our good deed of the day from St. Louis County, Missouri, where a police officer, we've had a lot of these types of stories over the last few days. I mean, I'm I'm not complaining about it. I'd much rather see the stories of officers saving babies than uh, babies not being saved. But a a one-week-old baby, I think yesterday's uh, good deed of the day was a a three-week-old who was revived by an officer. This time it's a one-week-old in St. Louis County. Uh, Officer Wesley Pierce, this was Sunday. Uh, responded to a call in North St. Louis County, ran into the home where a a newborn baby was starting to turn blue. Um, Officer Wesley Pierce is a father himself. He said, Mom handed the baby over to me. I listened to the Central County Fire Dispatch who gave me instructions on what to do because EMS wasn't there, fire rescue wasn't there. It was Officer Pierce. And that was it. He said, so I really give him, the dispatcher, all the props. He helped me through it. Uh, The baby was placed on the floor. Officer Pierce pressed down on her chest, gave her a mouth-to-mouth resuscitation uh, while the uh, dispatcher directed him. Wesley Pierce says, at first I was scared and nervous. And he's talking to the baby, saying, come on, sweetie, come on, baby, come on, there you go, baby, there you go. He said, uh, after multiple times of pressing down one inch on her chest, because again, you know, you're not an adult, so if you're doing infant CPR, you've got to be very careful. He said, halfway through, I looked down and she was still turning purple. But shortly after that, he said, the baby started crying. Mama's ecstatic. I was ecstatic. Paramedics arrived a couple minutes later. They took the uh, baby to a local hospital. She spent the last couple of nights there uh, just making sure everything is okay. Uh, Mom says that uh, her child, Taylor, was discharged on Wednesday. We'll have to undergo further sleep testing to figure out what's going on with her regular breathing. But in the right place, at the right time, and able to save a life, Officer Wesley Pierce. Let's put his picture up one more time from uh, Fox 2 there in St. Louis. Uh, Officer Wesley Pierce, we thank you, sir, for your very... Very good deed. That is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program today and every day that you're a part of the program. I hope that you enjoy your weekend. It is going to be so blazing hot and humid in the state of Virginia. We're looking at like 98 degrees tomorrow with 80% humidity. So I'm going to do yard work all day. Yay! How about that? Maybe get out and do a little bit of uh, shooting at the range, although I'm... Well, I'm on tight rations with my ammo right now, so I don't know how well I'll be able to do that. But uh, we're going to try to exercise our segment and rights a little bit this weekend. I hope you are able to do the same. We'll be back on Monday with more of the latest Second Amendment news, information, commentary, and conversation. But until then, be well, be safe, and be free. We'll see you soon with another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company.